Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Juan Zarati. I'm a senior advisor here. Really honored to be hosting the event this evening with a, a good friend uh, and, frankly, a legend of the intelligence community, Bob Grenier. Uh, Want to welcome you all. Thank you for taking the time to join us. A uh, lot of interest in the event, a lot of interest in Bob's book, 88 Days to Kandahar. Uh, for those watching online and you can't see the, the board behind me, uh, it's a great book, a wonderful read. Uh, and a great sort of uh, chronology and telling of some of the most important uh, events in the last 20 years of our history. Um, and in many ways, it follows the arc of Bob's um, career, where Bob has been at the center of some of the most important, controversial, and thorny issues that the nations had to confront. Uh, for those of you who don't know Bob's bio, uh, obviously it's available in the book jacket and as well as our materials, but. Uh, Bob was uh, the, the chief of station in Islamabad uh, on 9-11. And so both before and after 9-11 had responsibilities for what was happening both in Pakistan and in Af Afghanistan uh, and run, ran the southern campaign uh, and ultimately the takeover of Kandahar uh, from the Taliban, hence the title of the book, which I think is a great title. Uh, he was also the director of the Counterterrorism Center at the CIA at a time of great change both within the CIA, uh, great controversy, and also change within the US government in the counterterrorism world. Uh, that's when I got to know Bob well and, and had the honor of working with him and watching his handiwork both uh, within the bureaucracy and uh, in challenges to it. Um, and finally, uh, Bob was also responsible for the Iraq portfolio uh, right during the, uh, the invasion and, and in the aftermath of the invasion in Iraq. And so, you can imagine the, the breadth and scope of Bob's work, uh, which is not just confined to that period, of course, but uh, really is uh, seminal in terms of the history of the CIA, history of US counterterrorism, and uh, our, our work in Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, and Iraq. Uh, and so welcome. This is a real honor for me to, to host Bob, and certainly for CSIS to host Bob in his book event. Uh, Bob, I just I wanted to um, start by asking you um, generally, why uh, did you write the book and sort of set the table for us in terms of the story that you wanted to tell with 88 Days to Kandahar? Yeah, well, I did have occasion uh, numerous times to ask myself the same question. You know, why did you want to write the book? <laughs> but uh, I guess it all began for me on the 7th of December in 2001. And that was the day when both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda fled from Kandahar. And that afternoon, I had occasion just to reflect a little bit on what had happened in the previous weeks. And I actually got out a calendar, and I counted the days. And it was precisely 88 days from 9-11 until that 7th of December when both the Taliban and al-Qaeda fled. And uh, we thought at the time that we'd won what I now like to refer to as the first American-Afghan war. And I thought about the fact that at the outset, immediately after 9-11, I was very, very concerned, to say the very least. I, I was very concerned that this would go very, very badly. And I thought about the fact that the Northern Alliance had broken through the Taliban lines and had taken Kabul. Our two key uh, Pashtun tribal allies in the south, Hamid Karzai and uh, Gulag Sherzai, had not only survived, but actually, with American help, had ultimately driven both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda from their, their capital in Kandahar. We had managed in a sort of a perils of Pauline scenario to, uh, to save a small group of missionaries the, uh, who had been detained by the Taliban just before 9-11 and uh, who had, we'd somehow managed to, to save as, uh, as the Taliban structure was collapsing around Kabul. We had managed to get to the bottom of what we thought was a, a serious conspiracy on the part of a group of Pakistani scientists to provide nuclear materials or, God forbid, a nuclear weapon to al-Qaeda. I don't have to underline for you just what a tense situation that was before that was all resolved. There were so many things that could have gone so badly wrong, and instead they had gone right. And uh, I felt that at some point, someday, I was going to have to tell that story, the story of those 88 days. And I knew then what the title of the book would be. 
It's been a while in coming for this book. <laughs> and actually, I'm very glad that it has been. If I had written this book immediately after my retirement in 2006 or 2007, yeah, the core of the book would have been essentially the same, that adventure story as, as I sort of lived it during those 88 days. But there was so much at that point that we didn't yet know. And now at, at the cusp, as the United States has essentially withdrawn from Afghanistan, we're, we're down to a, a very small number of troops, as you all know, and as we're planning for what we all expect to be the end game between now and 2017, there's so much more that we know now about how this whole thing has turned out. So in the book, what I've tried to do is to write an accessible story for people who are not experts in this field. But then what I can do now that I wouldn't have been able to do had I written it, say, immediately after my retirement, is to wrap it up in a broader story, the geopolitical story of how we won the first American-Afghan War, how we, if not lost, certainly did not win the second American-Afghan War, and how the decisions that we're making now may yet set the stage for what may yet be a third American-Afghan war mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. And Bob, I think one of, the, one of the great values of the book is precisely what you've described, which is not just the historical telling of these key events, your, uh, your role in it, uh, and the key actors uh, at, at, in this time, but it's the relevance of the policy debates currently on, mm -hmm. on all of these issues. And I want to get back to that, because I right. think that's critically important as we look forward. But can you, as we, we look at sort of that pre-9-11, post-9-11 period, talk to us a little bit about your relationship, for example, with the Taliban. Mm -hmm. Because you, you were interacting with the Taliban. There were concerns about uh, the housing of the Arabs, uh, mm -hmm. the need to, to move them out, uh, the potential for further isolation of the Taliban in Afghanistan, and certainly post-9-11. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? And then also your relationship with the Pashtuns, uh, and in particular, Hamid Karzai, who mm -hmm. figures so prominently in your story and obviously yeah. then in Afghan history. Yeah. Well, um, when I first arrived in Pakistan as chief of station in the summer of 1999, uh, our involvement in and concern with Afghanistan was very myopically focused on Osama bin Laden himself. And we had a presidential finding to try to track down and, and arrest Osama bin Laden. It was, it was a, a so-called lethal finding, uh, the circumstances under which he could have been killed. Uh, we required several lawyers to walk you through. Um, so while it was a legal finding, unless if anyone would like to have a little seminar afterwards, I, I can sort of explain to you the, the circumstances under which we were tracking down bin Laden. It's hard but, to explain to the partners but, as well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so the, the people who were tracking him down and who you know, had certain ideas about how he might you know, meet his maker, uh, who had to be dissuaded from, uh, from doing what, the, what they proposed to do, um, we're very, very confused by the, the, uh, the, the laws and the structures that were surrounding what, what it was that we were trying to do with Mr. Bin Laden. But it, 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 it occurred to me about six months into the tour that even if we, against all odds, we were successful in arresting or killing Bin Laden, that that was not going to solve our problem. That we had a significant terrorist problem with all the, the number of what we then referred to as the Afghan Arabs who were uh, rushing into uh, Afghanistan, were receiving training that uh, even if bin Laden were to die of natural causes, that we would still have a, a serious terrorist safe haven problem in Afghanistan. And so we began to spread our aperture more widely and to focus much more on the Taliban itself. It, it seemed to, uh, to us that the only real solution to this problem was to deny safe haven to these international terrorists, which meant driving a wedge between the Taliban and, uh, and al-Qaeda. And uh, it it appeared to me that there were opportunities to do that. There were uh, substantial uh, players in, uh, among the Pashtun society from whence the Taliban was drawn uh, who, had, who were fed up with al-Qaeda. They had no time for bin Laden. Uh, Al-Qaeda was operating as a state within a state. There was a tremendous amount of resentment about that, uh, including within the Taliban leadership. And so it, uh, it seemed to us that uh, as we gathered more and more intelligence on the Taliban itself, as we gained more and more penetrations of the Taliban structure, both civilian and military, that there was a real opportunity for us here. And that uh, if we could uh, organize a tribal rebellion against the Taliban uh, under circumstances where it seemed to the Taliban that one of the drivers of that rebellion was the fact that they didn't want these foreigners operating with such impunity in their own state. 
and, and paying a price for it in terms of international sanctions. While at the same time, on the diplomatic side, uh, offering the, the Taliban some inducements. There were certain things that they wanted. They wanted to get the, the sanctions off. They wanted to be recognized as a legitimate government. They wanted the UN seat. Uh, that those two things in combination might actually convince Mullah Omar and the Taliban leadership to, uh, to change policy. So that's what we set about trying to do uh, uh, before 9-11. Uh, and in the context of that, we were reaching out during those days, particularly during the 18 months to one year before 9-11, as, uh, as Juan has just alluded, we were reaching out to uh, uh, Pashtun tribal leaders, most of whom were former commanders during the anti-Soviet jihad of the 1980s, most of, most of whom had a, a, a good um, impression of the United States and the aid that we had given them, and uh, most of whom were deeply resentful of the Taliban, who in many cases had, had pushed them aside, either into, into exile in Pakistan, or even if they remained in Afghanistan, some of them even fighting for the Taliban against the, the Northern Alliance, uh, clearly uh, wanted to get back in power. They were looking for an opportunity to do that. And uh, we, we suddenly had that opportunity, obviously, when 9-11 uh, happened. We, we reached out to them and said, now is your chance. If you will turn against the Taliban now, you will have the full weight of the American military with you. Uh, but uh, almost to a person, they demurred. They wanted to make sure that the Americans were serious. They wanted to make sure which way this struggle was going to go. You don't survive very long in Afghanistan as a tribal leader if you come in on the wrong side of the fight. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to find out which way this, this thing was going to go before they committed themselves. And so there were only two Pashtun tribal leaders of any significance who were actually willing, even before the U.S. had entered the, the fray, to, uh, to, to stick their heads up, take the chance of having them cut off and lead a tribal rebellion against the Taliban. That was Hamid Karzai, whom we all know and love. Uh, did can, can we go to slide two? There we go. It's a great picture of Bob and Hamid Karzai okay. in that period. That was... Uh, And uh, the other uh, significant tribal leader was uh, Gulag Ashurzai, uh, who was the, the former governor of Kandahar, had the dubious distinction of being the first provincial governor be, to be driven out of power by the, by the uh, Taliban when they, uh, when they organized themselves in 1994. And uh, uh, Hamid Karzai, in particular, uh, had a very rough time of it. He was literally being chased from mountaintop to mountaintop before we, uh, we, we rescued him in uh, in Urizgan province. He later reinserted, this time with a, a combined team of CIA and special forces, and, um, and made his way southward down to, uh, to Kandahar, and with the help of the US Air Force, did fairly well. Yeah. And, and Bob, you, you give great detail. I just love the book, because it's great detail and pace around sort of the march toward Kandahar, the, the survival of the, your key allies. Mm -hmm the interagency work with the military and the JSOC mm -hmm. operators. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk just a little bit, because so much of the book is focused on the march to Kandahar. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? And we've got the maps of the route that uh, Hamid mm -hmm. Karzai took and that Gulaga mm -hmm. uh, Sherza took as well. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a, a little bit about sort of how you were thinking about the southern campaign and how mm -hmm. that meshed with what was happening from the north, the northern alliance mm -hmm. movements toward Mazar Sharif and, and down toward Kabul? Yeah, to, to back up just a, a half step, it, at the outset, uh, before hostilities started, before the U.S. bombing campaign uh, began on October 7th, uh, there was a, a tremendous amount of debate, as you might imagine, in Washington about how we were going to marshal this campaign. And in fact, I received a, a phone call. Uh, it was a Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, my time, on the 23rd of September, it's 12 days after 9-11. And I got a surprise phone call from George Tenet. And uh, it was early Sunday morning, my time, late Saturday night, his time. And he said, uh, he said look, uh, we're going to meet at Camp David tomorrow. We're going to be discussing the war plan for Afghanistan. He said, the Pentagon is telling us that they have very few military targets at all. They can probably hit them all in a matter of days. 
He said, we know where all the terrorist training camps are, but they're all empty. The terrorists have all fled. And he literally asked me, he said, should we bomb empty camps? So I said, well, Mr. Director, I, I, I'm not sure we're thinking about this the right way here. This is primarily a political problem. We need to think about this in political terms. And so I started to walk him through it. Ultimately, uh, he asked me if I would put it all down on paper. I did. It was circulated to uh, the other members of the, the War Cabinet at the time they discussed it. In fact, it was adopted by the President uh, as, as the template for how we should move the, the, uh, the campaign forward. It became the, the war days. plan, mm -hmm. in essence. It, it, it became yeah. a, a war plan. Now, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy, and the, this one was, was no exception. But the, the thing that I stressed, and that, in fact, we, we did adhere to throughout the campaign, was that this must not be a U.S. invasion. This not, must not be perceived by the Afghans as a U.S. invasion. They must not think that we're coming in to, to seek permanent bases, territory, that uh, uh, we must never allow ourselves to be seen as an occupying force. We have to keep the, the, uh, the actual American military footprint very, very small. We need to present ourselves as coming in in support of Afghans who are trying to liberate their country from the Taliban and from al-Qaeda, and that while obviously we have an obvious ally in the North, the Northern Alliance, who have been fighting a civil war with, uh, with the Taliban for some years, that we must not, for the benefit of the Pashtuns, make it appear to them that we are simply entering the civil war on the other side. That will be disastrous. We knew that there was a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction among the Pashtuns with the, the Taliban. In fact, their political situation, I think, was worse than we appreciated at the time. It wasn't obvious to us until, until some time later. Um, but I feared that if we simply came in on the side of the Northern Alliance, that the, the Pashtuns would recoalesce around the Taliban and the problem of the terrorist safe haven would actually be worse rather than better. And so that's why, uh, as we were moving forward with the Northern Alliance, we, we stressed that it was so critically important that we first identify and then support Pashtun tribals who were willing to turn against the Taliban. And we, we found precisely two of them. There were others, but. Uh, but none who were as significant as, uh, as these two. And so the, 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 the plan that we followed was that these people must establish that they do, in fact, have a tribal following and can marshal their, tri their, uh, their tribal elements and, uh, and raise up that, their heads in rebellion against the Taliban, and then we will come in and support yeah. them. And, and all along the way, you had sort of a test of will and capacity with everybody you were dealing with, right? You've got to show us that you can marshal the... The, the, the troops and that you can defend a position in the, the whole nine yards. Exactly. So, uh, so Hamid Karzai, you know, goes into Afghanistan, he and, and, uh, and three others, uh, riding pillion on, on two motorcycles, rode into, uh, this, this is how our rebellion started. And he, he, <laughs> he rode right through Kandahar. Uh, they then traded their, their motorcycles for a taxi cab. They drove up into Uruzgan province at the, at the border between Kandahar and Uruzgan province, which was where, where uh, uh, which is the center of Hamid Karzai's tribal support. He was a Durrani Popolzai, and that, that was the home of the Popolzai. So as he's, as he's uh, driving in this taxi into Uruzgan, they're stopped at a, uh, at a check post. And uh, so here's this you know, guard who's probably about 15 years old, can't even you know, grow a beard. He's inspecting their vehicle, and he sees this bag. Well, it's the bag that had the satellite phone in it. He says, I want, to, I want to look inside your bag. So they said, no, no, you can't look inside our bag. And so one of his companions went into the guard post to talk to the, the man in charge. And the other ones, they, they had uh, a couple of weapons between them. And they, they said, we're not going to be taken captive. If these people come out to inspect the bag, we're going to kill them. We may die right here, but we're not going to be taken captive. Well, the officer in charge didn't care about them or their bag. And they just drove on up to, uh, to uh, Uruzgan. And obviously, I'm not going to you know, take you step by step through the whole process from there. But he went up to uh, Tyrene Coat, the, the, uh, the provincial seat, and began to organize uh, the, the tribals. He found that there was a lot of support for him, a lot of dissatisfaction with, with uh, uh, the, the Taliban. But the Taliban very quickly discovered that he was there, and they sent a force north to track him down. And the, uh, the tribal elders who were supporting him said, look, we're very sorry. We don't have enough men under arms to protect you. And uh, so take some people and, and, and go up into the mountains, which he did. And he was literally being chased from mountaintop to, to mountaintop. Uh, he was telling us you know, breathlessly about you know, the, 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 the numbers of people who were attracted to his banner. Uh, I think that he was um, 
optimistic, I think, is, is probably <laughs> to put a, it mildly, a, right? a, a good term to use uh, about the, the number of people who were with him at, uh, at any given point in time. Uh, ultimately, we had to, we had to uh, uh, evacuate him, then reinsert him. Uh, at, at no time, frankly, did he ever have more than 350 people under arms and with him as he made his way down to Kandahar. And they were very nearly wiped out uh, very early on after their reinsertion at the Battle of Tarin Kot. And uh, it's, uh, I, I didn't realize at the time just That's how close to annihilation that they actually were. Uh, I was sitting in my office in Islamabad, and a, um, a special forces representative came rushing into my office. He said, my god, this is a turkey shoot. Once uh, all these American pilots who were there in the, in the area of operations realized that you had Americans who were under attack by the Taliban, they all rushed there and they were literally being stacked up like airplanes at LaGuardia uh, to, to try to make bombing runs against the, the Taliban. The Taliban you know, suffered very, very heavy losses and uh, that was probably the critical battle of the campaign. He then made his way south. There were a number of other skirmishes, including one where he was very nearly killed by the Americans, by a, a, an American JDAM. Um, at a place called, um, uh, called Shawali Kot, just north of, uh, of Kandahar. In the meantime, uh, Gulag uh, was managed to organize a much larger force uh, in the Shinnare Valley, uh, just along the, the, uh, the Afghan-Pakistan border. Uh, that, that was his home area. He was a Baraksai uh, tribesman, and uh, as I say, uh, managed to organize a, a large force. There were a number of skirmishes, a major battle at a, at a place. Slide four, please. Uh, Sorry? Yeah, no, not you. Slide four? Yeah. The, the map? Mm -hmm. There we go. Perfect. So, yeah, that's right. And uh, so it, um, he went through a, uh, through a spin bulldog, and then when he reached the main highway uh, to, to go into uh, to Kandahar, fought a major battle there. Fought another major battle, uh, first with the Taliban, and then with al-Qaeda at the, at the Kandahar airport. Um, spent about five days there. I was uh, on the, the telephone at this time with, uh, with the deputy foreign minister. Of, uh, of the Taliban who had been a contact of mine, not a recruited source, mind you, by any means, but somebody with whom I was just talking from, uh, from well before 9-11. Uh, and uh, he told me that um, they were actually encouraging al-Qaeda to fight with the Americans at the airport. And he said, we hope that you will kill as many of them as possible. They're getting in the way of our negotiations. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so much for Taliban al-Qaeda solidarity. Um, ultimately, uh, the, uh, the uh, al-Qaeda fighters, about 500 of them or so, uh, realized that they were fighting a losing battle at the airport, and uh, they organized themselves and, uh, and fled uh, Kandahar on the same day that, that the, the Taliban fled yeah. as well. And um, it was actually Gulag al who was the first to reclaim the old uh, governor's palace in Kandahar. Uh, he, he saw his opportunity, and he, he rushed inside. And it was only it was two days later, in fact, that um, that Hamid Karzai actually made his way into town. There was a little bit of uh, bit, a bit of a kerfuffle as to uh, who was going to be in charge here <laughs> and uh, who should take what parts of the city. Uh, at one point, uh, not only were the Afghans uh, fighting between some, uh, themselves, but their their uh, CIA sponsors were fighting between themselves over who really ought to be in, in charge here. Uh, so it, it took a, a little bit of refereeing to sort this yeah. whole thing out. We said it's entirely too soon in the, in the process for Afghans, for Al Ad Afghans to, to be killing each other. And uh, there's going to be time enough for that later on, as we all saw. That's great. So Bob, take us forward then, December 7th, take over Kandahar. Now you've got the problem of the Arabs, Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. the hunt for bin Laden. Right. And, and this, in some ways, takes us forward to your role mm -hmm. as head of CTC as well. Mm -hmm. um, Talk to us a little bit about sort of the hunt for bin Laden, how you were thinking about the fight against Al Qaeda, not just in those immediate sort of days and months, but mm -hmm. even longer term. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you can touch a little bit on the story of Tora Bora, because I think that holds a lot in the imagination of people's minds. And if we can go to slide five, I think there's a, mm -hmm. there's a good picture of you with yeah. uh, some tribal mm -hmm. forces on the Pakistani side. on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, way up in, the, in what's called the Parrot Speak, the, the far northwest of Pakistan. Uh, those mountains that you see in the background are, are called by the Pakistanis the Safed Ko. Uh, they're called the, uh, the Spingar Mountains by, uh, by the Afghans. And just on the other side of those peaks uh, is Tora Bora. And at the time that I was up there, I, I've got an ISI general uh, with me, who's escorting me. We've got a number, a number of uh, members of the, the Frontier Corps, the Karam Militia, who are providing an escort. And uh, the general and I had gone up there to see what was the state of the Pakistani 
uh, border presence because we were very concerned that as the American bombing at Tora Bora was continuing, that significant numbers of Al-Qaeda fighters would come through the, the passes onto the Pakistani side. We wanted to make sure that they were intercepted, they were intercepted while they were there. And, and just a, a few days after uh, our trip up there and after the general filed his report, the governor of the Northwest Frontier Province uh, held a meeting, a jirga, with uh, tribal elders in the area. And they agreed that the PAC army could move up into those mountains and, uh, and, and try to, uh, to set some sort of a trap for the Al-Qaeda fighters as they came through as they came through the peaks. And ultimately, that's what happened. Uh, how many of them uh, managed to safely get through, we will never know. They probably captured about 130 of them. At the same time, when I mentioned on uh, the 7th of December, as the Taliban and Al-Qaeda were fleeing, uh, I actually had one of my officers sitting on a little hill just east of Kandahar uh, and with a, a radio that they had captured from the Arabs. And he was listening to them. That They sounded like a bunch of tourists as they were organizing their vehicles. In fact, he actually heard somebody say, make sure, don't forget your passports. And uh, wow. unfortunately, uh, the, our, our special forces uh, A team, which is only 12 individuals, they were off fighting with Gulaga at the airport before they, they realized that, that the Ar Arabs had actually fled. And so there was nobody to actually call in an airstrike. And he actually watched as 300 members of Al-Qaeda in about 50 vehicles just drove on out of Kandahar and disappeared up the, the Kandahar hmm. Kabul Highway. And uh, we don't know, uh, but we suppose that many of those were the individuals who were later fought by the US military at a battle called uh, Operation Anaconda, the Battle of Shahi Kot, which took place in uh, March, April of, uh, of 2002. Uh, that fight did not go very well, but the, uh, the, the Arab fighters uh, fled again further off to the east, this time across the border into Pakistan. And so this, this began what was for us the second phase. First, it was driving Al-Qaeda and the Taliban out of power. As Al-Qaeda fled out of uh, Afghanistan, we were very concerned about inter intercepting them on the other side. And uh, during those early days in uh, 2002, the first six months or so of 2002, we were doing a land office business. We, were, we and the Pakistani intelligence service, the ISI, were mounting raids on almost a, night, a nightly basis. It was US intelligence that was determining the safe houses that were being employed uh, by the Arabs, as, as we referred to them in those days, um, and, uh, and capturing them. And many of them were immediately turned over to the US Air Force and, and uh, found new homes in Guantanamo Bay. Um, but uh, as the, the, the spring wore on, we began to realize that a significant number of these Al-Qaeda fighters were finding safe haven, not in the settled areas of Pakistan where we, where we could catch them, but in the tribal areas of Pakistan. And I began to importune the Pakistani military to move into those areas to, uh, to verify the reports that we were getting that significant numbers of Arabs were, were hiding in, in various locations. And that was where we, we we saw the beginning of what was to become a long twilight struggle between ourselves and the Pakistanis, trying to get the Pakistanis to take effective action against uh, Al-Qaeda members in the tribal areas. The Pakistanis, for very understandable reasons, being very reluctant to do so, because as a, uh, a then little known major general by the name of Kayani, later became the chief of army staff, uh, most powerful man in, in Pakistan, uh, at the time that I first knew him in the spring of 2002, he was the director uh, general of military operations. And he was saying to me, look, I can do what you're asking me to do. I can move forces into this area. It's almost guaranteed that I will touch off a tribal war if I do so. And he said, we can deal with that as well. But if, I, if, the, if the Masoods and the Waziris rise up together against us in South Waziristan, it's going to take me three brigades of troops to put it down. And those troops have to come from our border with India. And at that time, the Indian Army was fully mobilized and on the border with Pakistan, threatening to invade. He said, I can't afford to pull those troops off the Indian border. And therefore, if I can't deal with the consequences that may arise if I do what you ask, I can't do what you ask. And so instead, he launched a, a, a much lower profile effort to try to, um, to, try to, to, uh, to root out the, uh, these uh, Al-Qaeda fighters, uh, and as he feared, in fact, he did touch off a tribal war. The Pakistan army did ultimately have to uh, invest South Waziristan, occupy South Waziristan, and in the subsequent years, they were very, very reluctant to uh, reprise that process and move into North Waziristan because they knew that was going to be a much tougher fight. And in fact, it's only in the past few months, as we all know, that the Pakistanis ultimately have actually moved into yeah. Waziristan. 
And they've gotten bloodied when they've done that. They, they yeah. have lost many thousands of troops uh, during this, this whole process. And uh, so it, it's been a very, very painful thing for the Pakistanis. Bob, can we stay on Pakistan for a second and maybe go to slide six because we've got another great picture of you with, uh, uh, slide six is with uh, Tommy Franks, mm -hmm. General Franks um, and the Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of skepticism, of course, about the Pakistani mm -hmm. uh, military and mm -hmm. the ISI, the intelligence services. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions as to whether or not they knew about bin Laden's presence in Abbottabad right. and whether or not, uh, to your point, they were as aggressive as We could see the roots of the, the disagreements and the misunderstandings that we have suffered through with the Pakistanis ever since and that still haunt us to this day. And with regard to al-Qaeda, the, the Pakistanis really never had any brief for al-Qaeda. They, they certainly were never supportive of bin Laden. Uh, they weren't willing to cooperate with us against bin Laden and al-Qaeda before 9-11, not because they were supportive of them per se, uh, but simply because they were very piqued with us. Uh, when we no longer needed them after the, the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, they, we, we sanctioned three ways for, for, from Sunday for their nuclear program, the, their missile proliferation programs, other things that we found highly problematic. And so they had no incentive to cooperate with us. After 9-11, they were very, very clear that they were going to support us against al-Qaeda unless and until the price for them was going to be too high. And that was the, the, the issue that we ran up against in the tribal areas and something that uh, still haunts us right up until the, the present day. With regard to the Taliban, there was a very quick evolution. In the very early days, immediately after 9-11, the Pakistanis were very supportive of our efforts against the Taliban. Obviously, they provided with, with us with a base of operation. Uh, the ISI was providing uh, me with facilitation so that we could get Afghan fighters across the line to attack the Taliban. And they were, they were very, very supportive. But within really a matter of weeks, certainly by early 2002, it was very clear that the Pakistanis had pause and that there was, it was a large element of ambiguity that was creeping into their policy. They could see that even though Hamid Karzai had been elevated by the UN to be the interim ruler of Afghanistan, they could see that this was going to be a, norm, a Northern Alliance-dominated government. They knew the historical relations that the Northern Alliance had had with India in particular, uh, the, the Russians secondarily. They could see that the Indians were moving to start opening up uh, consulates in various parts of Afghanistan where there wasn't a very large Hindu population to minister to. They were very, very specific, they were very, very suspicious about what was going on. And they were very concerned lest they unilaterally break uh, the, the last ties that they had with the Taliban. Now, mind you, before 9-11, there was already a great deal of distrust between the Pakistanis and the Taliban. This was not, this was a very wary relationship at best, although clearly as a matter of, of national security, the Pakistanis were unambiguously supporting the Taliban. You can imagine how distrustful that relationship was after 9-11 and as we got into 2002, given what the Pakistanis had done to the Taliban in support of the American effort. Nonetheless, the Pakistanis did want to retain at least the option of a future relationship with the Taliban against the day when that might become important for them uh, in dealing with a government in Kabul which they saw as hostile to their interests. So in those days, in early 2002, and, and, in, and even more so in the years subsequently, as the Americans and the Pakistanis were cooperating very, very effectively to capture and or kill members of al-Qaeda, when we would provide them with information concerning senior Taliban members, members of the Taliban Shura, somehow, mysteriously, those investigations never turned out very well. And it didn't take very long to figure out that there was a pattern here and that maybe the Pakistanis were a little bit ambivalent and hedging about, about all this and, and, and uh, engaging in, uh, in hedging behaviors. Yeah. Uh, that, that became even more uh, pointed in later years, starting particularly in 2005, as we saw increasing numbers of Pakistani-based militants 
crossing the border to attack US, NATO, and Afghan forces inside Afghanistan. And there, I think it was a matter, I think, frankly, there was a lot of misunderstanding on, on the part of the Americans. And you can imagine your American military, including some right here in this room, I know, uh, and you're watching militants as they're going right past Pakistani check posts and to attack your positions inside of Afghanistan. Well, to you, that's going to look like collusion. To the Pakistanis, that was looking like somebody else's fight. They were very, very uh, vulnerable out there. They, they were having a difficult enough time with militants who were turning against them because of their support, because of the militant support to Al-Qaeda and, and uh, Pakistani perceived support to the American effort to track them down. They didn't want militants who were focused primarily on Afghanistan to turn against them as well. And uh, so as far as they were concerned, they knew that they were very vulnerable. They knew that if the local militants in a particular area uh, decided to interdict their supply convoys, they could do so very easily. Uh, this is an area of Pakistan where every boy above the age of 12 has an AK-47. They didn't want to fight with these people unless it was absolutely necessary. And so I think you can imagine the sort of, of, um, sort of mutual suspicion that rose up yeah. around all of that. Bob, let me ask you two more questions. One is sort of a thematic question that implicates Afghanistan, Iraq, and just our our foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are a, a number of great themes in your book, uh, three that I think are interesting. One is this theme of abandonment that you talked about mm -hmm. that was sensed by some of the Afghans, the Mujahideen, the, some of the Pashtun mm -hmm. tribes, mm -hmm. obviously a core theme from the Pakistanis, mm -hmm. um, and at play to a certain extent um, in Iraq currently. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can talk about sort of sort of the theme of abandonment in our policy and the way we've, mm -hmm. we've interacted with various tribes and groups over time. That would mm -hmm. be, I think, important. Mm -hmm. um, the, other, the other question is, you did battle often in the interagency, and this was both in the context of Afghanistan and Iraq, mm -hmm. with this question of light footprint, heavy footprint, right. and the perception of US occupation or not, right. um, and, and how we went about doing what we had to do. Uh, because mm -hmm. in many ways, you, you don't argue against the policies, for example, going into Iraq. It's, mm -hmm. it's how we did it. Mm -hmm. right? And so can you speak to those two themes, which I think are really interesting because they translate both in the context of Afghanistan and Iraq and translate, frankly, moving forward mm -hmm. uh, in South Asia and in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think, that obviously, the, the theme of American ab abandonment has been a very strong one in the dialogue between the, the, the Pakistanis and ourselves. And looking at it from a, a Pakistani point of view, you can readily understand why that would be. Um, in fact, I was just talking to uh, an old State Department colleague the other day who was in uh, the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the time, uh, uh, analyzing the growing body of intelligence that the US had during the 1980s, during the anti-Soviet jihad, when we had a very close relationship with the Pakistanis, about the growing Pakistani nuclear program. Somehow or other, we managed to overlook all of that evidence, which, which once we had accepted it, was going to trigger automatic sanctions under the Pressler Amendment that had, been, uh, that had been passed in Congress. Somehow, we managed to overlook all of that evidence until the Soviets withdrew. Suddenly, it was staring us right in the face, and we had no choice but, but to sanction the, the Pakistanis very heavily. Well, the this was not entirely lost on the Pakistanis. And when, after 9-11, they made, President Musharraf made the strategic decision that you know, when he was, he was given the offer, either you're for us or you're against us, and you decided to, to be for us. Um, as far as in the Pakistani mindset, this was just another turn of the same cycle. Great. Now we're going to be strategic allies of the Americans. But we know full well that when we are no longer useful to the Americans in Afghanistan, that is probably going to change again. And so all of their behaviors, all of their calculations were made on that basis. It's not the way we were thinking. It was very much the way that they were thinking. And it, it, it helped to presage much of the difficulty that we've seen with the, Pakistan, with the Pakistanis in, uh, in subsequent years. And, and I think that, that we are seeing similar things play out with others with whom we have cooperated on a tactical basis. We perhaps were not thinking of it tactically. We probably weren't thinking of it tactically when we were cooperating. So we CIA were cooperating with the Mountain Yards in, uh, in Laos you know, dur during the, the course of the Vietnam War. And yet they paid a very heavy price when, when we decided to leave. Uh, there are parties in Afghanistan now as we speak who I'm sure are paying a very heavy price for their former association with us uh, 
uh, when the U.S. has decided to substantially scale down its, uh, its presence there. And the same is true with a number of parties, you know, particularly uh, uh, Sunni tribesmen in, uh, in Western Iraq who threw their lot in with the Americans and uh, who were not able to sustain that relationship then with a Shiite-dominated government in Baghdad. So again, this, on, on different levels and in different ways, this theme of American abandonment is, uh, is one with which we have to grapple and, um, and one which, uh, which, uh, which haunts us. And frankly, I, I'm almost surprised that we have managed to convince over the years as many parties as we have to cooperate with us, knowing full well that at a certain point, it may no longer be convenient for the Americans to cooperate with us, and we're going to have to fend for ourselves. Um, with regard to this whole idea of heavy footprint, light footprint, um, as I just mentioned before, I felt very strongly at the outset in Afghanistan that we, we needed to have a very light footprint, that although the war against the Taliban would not be prosecuted anywhere near as efficiently uh, using uh, or supporting Afghans who were operating on their own account and with their own motivations than it would be if we simply went in and invaded the place. I felt that if we simply went in and invaded the place that we would repeat the very bitter history that had been suffered by the, the Soviets and the British before us in the 20th and the 19th centuries, respectively. It was a very different situation, obviously, in, in uh, well, actually, maybe before I leave Afghanistan, let me just sort of fast forward a little bit to 2005. Uh, yeah, like, like much of the, the US command structure, if you will, I checked out of Pakistan, Afghanistan in the summer of 2002, quickly found myself the, the Iraq mission manager of the CIA for about a two and a half year period. And by the time I came back to focus once again on Afghanistan and Pakistan, this time as the director of the Counterterrorism Center at CIA, I fairly early on in the spring of, of 2005, I made a, an extensive visit out both to Pakistan and to Afghanistan. And you could begin to see, we didn't fully appreciate it at the time, but you could begin to see that the situation in Afghanistan was starting to slip away from us. You mm -hmm. could see a growing number of militants based inside Pakistan who were coming across the border and, and attacking uh, uh, American and, uh, and Afghan check posts and facilities there. You could begin to see that the Taliban was regaining traction in certain pushed in areas of, uh, of the country. And it was in the, the period subsequent to that that I believe we made first incrementally in the Bush administration and then uh, in a very organized and strategic fashion in the Obama administration, the decision that essentially we were gonna take over this fight. It seemed that our Afghan allies were simply not up to the task for all the reasons that you're very familiar with. They were corrupt, they were ill-organized, uh, they, their army had not yet developed sufficient strength that it could impose its control over the entire country. And essentially, we decided that at least for the, an interim period, until we could bring the Afghans along, Afghanistan was too important to be left to Afghans. And essentially, the Americans had to, had to take over uh, the struggle at its height. As we all know, we had 100,000 US troops, an additional 40,000 from NATO. We were spending $100 billion a year. Frankly, we just completely overwhelmed this small, primitive, agrarian country and uh, in a way that didn't redound very well for them or for us, particularly when President Obama realized what, what the price tag was going to be and decided that, wait a minute, we need to rethink the, this whole proposition and maybe scale back our aspirations for Afghanistan. Uh, and in my humble opinion, I think that was, that was a, a big mistake and that we should have recognized much earlier on that the principles that we followed the first time around were ones that we should continue to follow in the future, despite the fact that it, it would mean that in terms of our aspirations, we were gonna to have to be much less ambitious than in fact we were when President Obama rolled out his, his first plan for Afghanistan in March of 2009. Uh, in Iraq, we had a very, very different situation. We weren't talking about you know, working through Iraqis. If we, were going to over, if we were going to defeat Saddam's army, it was American forces that were going to have to do it. And uh, I stated then, and I will still say, state now, that I supported our effort. Obviously, you know, many people think now that that was a colossal mistake. We don't know what would have happened had we not invaded Iraq and overthrown Saddam. It might have been a whole other history that might have been uh, equally as painful, in fact, maybe even more painful, if you think about the fact that had Saddam ultimately, as we feared, he, he soon would cast off the sanctions regime and been able to rebuild his, his, um, 
his uh, weapons of mass destruction programs, as we were quite sure he would, what kind of a situation we would be facing right now in, uh, in the Persian Gulf. Um, but that said, I think, that is, is Juan has alluded, that the big mistake that we made, in my estimation at least, was not in invading Afghanistan. It was the way in which we, we tried to go about politically reconstructing Afghanistan. Iraq. Uh, I'm sorry. Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. I keep saying Afghanistan. Yeah, I get it on the okay. brain. Um, but uh, politically reconstructing yeah. Iraq. Um, and, uh, and there, as uh, I agree with many, that we made some very, very serious mistakes in formally disbanding the Iraqi army, uh, formally banning the, the, the Ba'ath Party. Uh, once again, I, I felt that we should sacrifice a certain measure of control in order to have a legitimate political process that ultimately would throw up uh, uh, genuine uh, uh, leaders uh, in, uh, in uh, Iraq that had genuine uh, local political support. Instead, we opted for control. And again, I think that that was a, a very big mistake. And, it, and it's what, again, in my uh, estimation, touched off the insurgency and everything that's, that, that's come since. Well, I think I could ask you 88,000 questions. So I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reserve. And I'm going to hold the final one uh, maybe for the, the end. But mm -hmm. um, let me just one point of privilege before I open it up to the audience and start getting your questions ready. We've got a microphone. Um, one, one thing I wanted to note is that our uh, former colleague, uh, Arnaud de Borsgrave, who recently passed away, uh, was the head of the Transnational Threat uh, Project, legendary journalist, uh, legendary uh, member of CSIS, knew Bob well, features in the book. There's a story of Arnaud appearing uh, to, to track down bin Laden and others yes. at the time. And Arnaud was incredibly courageous and uh, <laughs> intrepid in his work, and, and uh, Bob and he formed a good friendship. And in fact, the three of us were on a panel uh, a few years ago at mm -hmm. the Global Security Forum. So I wanted to pay tribute to Arnaud mm -hmm. uh, and, and note that Arnaud is, uh, is with us in spirit, uh, yes. certainly. So let's go with questions. Yes, right here. And if you could identify yourself, please, and uh, ask a question. Thank you. Uh, John Rothenberg, longtime Afghanistan specialist. Um, I have two questions. I hope I can do that. Um, my first one is that. Uh, I'm halfway through the book, it's great. Uh, but it seemed to me that um, you felt that negotiating with the Taliban to get the uh, Al-Qaeda handed over was a better option. Um, is, uh, do you think if you had more time and flexibility that that would have happened and what would have been the result? Um, my second one is that um, I was part of the civilian surge. I was on a base in the capital of Paktika and doing capacity building with the Afghan government. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, um, and I, I've been around since 88, um, and one of the things that I felt why the Taliban came in and why the, the Pashtun provinces like Paktika do not support the government mm -hmm. is because of the corruption of players like um, Shirzai. Um, and that, and that w we brought back a lot of the problems that they didn't like to start with. Mm -hmm. And I want to just wanted to know what, to know what you thought about that. Yeah. Well, as, as you've noted already, I, I'm given to overlong answers. Um, uh, but the, my answer to your first question is very short. It, it's no. <laughs> uh, the, the, the question again, and tell me if I've got this right is you know, I, I did try to negotiate with uh, the, the number two figure in the Taliban at the time, Mullah Osmani, uh, to see, first of all, if he could convince Mullah Omar to change policy and to turn bin Laden and his key lieutenants over to us. And then failing that, in a second meeting with Mullah Osmani, I, uh, I tried to persuade him uh, to move Mullah Omar aside and do himself what Mullah Omar clearly would not. And uh, he actually agreed to do that briefly. Uh, I think he thought better of it as soon as he got back to, to Kandahar. And uh, we continued uh, to talk on, by, by satellite phone uh, with him in, in Kandahar, me in, uh, in Islamabad, even after the, the US bombing. Um, and so the, the question is, you know, well, was there ever a, re a real opportunity for a negotiated solution with the Taliban? If we'd had some more time would, is it possible that that might have succeeded? And you know, as much as I would like to say that you know, with my persuasive brilliance, if I'd just been given a little bit more time, somehow I could have brought them around. Uh, in fact, I don't think I don't think it was in the cards. Uh, to a, it was only later that I realized the extent of Mullah Omar's hold on his people. 
there was no way that, that Osmani was actually going to lead a rebellion against Mullah Omar for a whole lot of, of reasons, organizational, psychological, and others. And Mullah Omar, I'm convinced, is, is a very singular Afghan. He's a very, in, their, in their context, their culture, he's, he's a, a very uh, impressive individual. Um, so no, I don't think that that would, that would ever have worked. Had we, as we, we tried, uh, at my uh, instigation, the, the first target that we hit in Afghanistan at the start of the air campaign on October 7th was Mullah Omar's compound. We missed him by 30 minutes. Uh, had he been killed in the first wave, then something might have been possible. Uh, and, and then this relationship that I built up with Mullah Osmani might have actually borne fruit, and who knows where, where things would have, uh, would have gone from there. Even then, I think it would have been highly problematic. Um, with regard to the, the, the second issue, and, and that, that's this whole issue of, of you know, governance in, in Afghanistan. And on the one hand, you know, should, should we have been focusing, as in fact we did, um, on you know, trying to build up a highly centralized government structure with a large army and police force that would be able to impose its will on, uh, on the country and, uh, and establish good governance and marginalize the, uh, the local warlords who had actually brought uh, Afghanistan to grief in the, the period after the Soviet withdrawal and, that, and, and whose, whose rapaciousness actually led to the rise of the Taliban in the first place. Um, and I guess my view on that is that we've never really had that sort of a, a highly centralized, highly effective Afghan government. Uh, I'm not sure that in our lifetimes it, it would have been possible to construct one, particularly, particularly with the, uh, the competition from, from the Taliban. On the other hand, what about these warlords who, as you say, I mean, you know far better than I do, having spent the, the time there that, that you did, uh, the extent to which uh, corrupt local leaders, and, and, and mind you, that this, this centralized Afghan government was essentially um, established as a vertically integrated criminal enterprise, where all of the, of the, 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 uh, the positions of authority, even at the local level, the district level, were, were made, those appointments were all made in, in Kabul. And essentially, in many cases, there were licenses to steal with the ill-gotten gains flowing back up the, the, the chain to the people who'd, who'd uh, named these individuals to those positions in the first place. Not, not a good basis on which to establish good governance. Um, and so what then is the alternative, knowing that things are never going to, Afghanistan is never going to look like Ohio? Well, I guess what I had thought at the outset was that we ought to continue to work with warlords uh, as we had uh, at the outset, uh, that we should have CIA, State Department, other American agencies working in conjunction with one another and in and uh, and closely with these uh, these individuals who did have local weight, whether tribal or, or otherwise, and try to help them to be the best warlords they could be. Um, and I, I'll just I'll just cite you a, a small story. This is probably something that that, that you've heard of. Uh, 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 Pacha Khan Sadran, who was, uh, again, the warlord in uh, eastern Afghanistan uh, shortly after 9-11, uh, and as it, as it became apparent that these different areas were beginning to slip away from Taliban control, Pacha Khan comes across the border to Islamabad and uh, rolls up and says, I'm your man. And this is in the area around Khost in, uh, in eastern Afghanistan. And he said, you know, if you want to rule this area, I said, I'm, I'm the guy. You need to deal through me. So he said, oh, interesting. Uh, you're a Zadran. Where are the other tribes in your area? Come back to us with representatives of all those other tribes, and then we'll talk. And you know, in, in my view, if we had had the right people, Americans, with the right background, the right basis of knowledge, uh, the right temperament to deal with individuals like this in various key areas of Afghanistan, to uh, uh, condition our support for them on their uh, subservience, for lack of, of a better word, to appropriate local authority, establishing insurers, with some sort of a link to the, to the central government, uh, including some sort of a link between their local militias, which I thought we should be supporting, uh, and the local government, and the, 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 the sort of the model that I had in mind was something like the Frontier Corps in Pakistan, where you have local forces uh, that, that have nonetheless a link with, 
with the, uh, with the central government, that we might have been able to build something which wouldn't have been pretty in all places at all times, but might at least have been viable and might at least have been able to keep out the, uh, the, the Taliban. And I think that in having, in, mo in most cases, refused to support these individuals for a highly understandable reasons in favor of building up a very large and unsustainable Afghan military uh, that we allowed a, a vacuum of power to arise, which in conjunction with, with the factors that you've just mentioned, um, created space for, for the Taliban and led to the problem that we're dealing with right now. Would another policy have succeeded where this one has failed? Who knows, but I, I, I feel that we went down the wrong path. Another question up here, please. Mm -hmm. Continuing on what you just said about the right staff or the right staff. Could you right quickly just identify yourself no. quickly? Oh. Sure. Um, Alvil Singh, independent researcher. There you go. So going back to what you were saying about like the right staff, the right people mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. would you then say, so I have a two-part question. Mm -hmm. One is that the CIA did not have the right staff at the right time, mm -hmm. meaning we're, 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 we're taking this outside of the scope. Mm -hmm. as an HR issue mm -hmm. in terms of recruitment. Mm -hmm. Homeland Security, mm -hmm. NSA, everyone else has mm -hmm. this issue right now. Right. So go back, mm -hmm. we're not talking about 2000, you know, 9-11, mm -hmm. we're going back a decade mm -hmm. where the infrastructure was mm -hmm. a Cold War mentality. Mm -hmm. And at that, so juxtapose that with the hiring strategy and every, the entire mindset of the intelligence agencies mm -hmm. and the entire government. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing right now is the CIA restructuring mm -hmm. to deal with the current conditions on the road. Mm -hmm. Had you had the right staff mm -hmm. and the right capabilities, I think you would have done a lot more mm -hmm. on the ground in terms of, let me put it this mm -hmm. way, as a CIA station mm -hmm. chief, my skin color would do much more than what yours is mm -hmm. right now. And mm -hmm. my, th the second part, I won't, but. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and, and it, particularly it, folks below the level of the station chief. You know, it's fine to have the station chief as a, as a figurehead, you know, hobnobbing with, with Pakistani officials. It's, it's, the folks, it's the folks who actually do the work on the ground. They're the ones who have to be able to. Well, Bob, that. if I can piggyback off this, it, it's also a continuity question. Right? Do we have too it, it much is. shifting, right? Yeah. And, and, and also, just maybe if it, the, sort of the mm -hmm. coda to this, mm -hmm. you know, this is the subtitle is a CIA diary. Right. Right. What's the future of the CIA in the context mm -hmm. of this? Are, are, we, mm -hmm. are we positioning ourselves properly for the threats and the, the uh, challenges to come? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that the CIA did a pretty good job of pivoting from the Cold War uh, to deal with a, a world where the, the threats were going to be quite different. Um, that, did, it, did it do that well enough? Did it have enough uh, foresight to know, you know where the, the greatest challenges were going to be? Well, no, absolutely not. Um, you know, did I know two years before 9-11 that essentially you know, a little over uh, two years later, uh, we were going to be taking on a, a quasi-colonial project in Afghanistan for which we would need appropriate people? Well, absolutely not. I didn't know that. Um, that said, I think that with the people that we had, with the, with the Dari speakers that we had, with uh, people who had, who had uh, dealt in analogous situations uh, in the third world, had a, had a feel for tribal politics, had we been able to keep all of them focused on that particular coalface, I think we would have done a great deal better. As we all know, we had to pivot again, this time to Iraq. Uh, and so we, we had to uh, divide up very scarce resources very rapidly, which I think made it much more difficult. But you know, again, we could spend an awful long time talking about, you know, sort of from, from an HR point of view, how do you poise an organization uh, to enable it to do what it needs to do and to sustain that effort, as, uh, as Juan says, uh, when people need to develop their careers. You know, we, we have an organization that says that, no, you have to get different experiences. You know, you, you've got to move from, from a worker bee level up through uh, uh, different le levels of management when, in point of fact, maybe you want to keep those people working at the, at the tactical level and for their whole careers. And how do you incentivize them to do that? And that, that's been, that's been a, a tremendous challenge in CIA as it has been 
in, uh, in other organizations. State um, departments has that challenge, FBI, others, yeah. Absolutely, you have a demographic thing. I, I, I know, and, and Juan, you may know a whole lot more about, about this than, uh, than I do, and this gentleman here in the back may know uh, still more um, <laughs> about uh, what, what the military uh, has attempted to do in, uh, in, in putting together what, what was referred to as the Afghan Hands Program, mm -hmm. where they were trying to build up a, a significant uh, number of individuals with real expertise in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, who would work out in the, in the war zones, come back to, to continue working those issues and, and improving their skills at the Pentagon level, go back out again. And you know, again, I haven't seen this from the inside, but you simply did not have a structure within the US military that would facilitate that. Everything was working against their ability to do that over time. And I think we, we have similar challenges throughout the bureaucracy. Let's go with one more question. We're running out of time. This gentleman here, standing up. Hi, uh, Paul Hobbes, uh, DOD, active duty military. And uh, as such, just wanted to mention, uh, thank you very much for your service and for the service of your former colleagues who, uh, you know, working in the shadows don't get nearly as much um, accol public accolades as uh, my military brothers and sisters in uniform. Um, you mentioned earlier about big footprint, little footprint in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, just from my reading and open source books and that kind of stuff, um, the position of our much maligned uh, vice president was, uh, my, as I understand, a smaller footprint, yeah. emphasizing special forces and drones versus a large print footprint, which we ended up going with. Uh, your comments, please. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Yeah, did, did you all hear the, hear the question clearly? Yeah, OK. OK, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, the, uh, with the, and tell me if I, if I got this right, I, I think the, uh, the question revolves around this whole issue of a, a big footprint, small footprint, uh, and the fact that we are told that in the interagency debate leading up uh, to the, the first uh, Afghan plan in the Obama administration, which was rolled out in March of 2009, and then subsequently uh, thoroughly revised in December uh, of that year, that during that time, uh, Vice President Joe Biden was arguing for, I think, what, what, he, what he referred to as counterterrorism plus. That is a much smaller US footprint, not having 100,000 US troops and an additional 40,000 from NATO, but rather uh, keeping it a, a, a much smaller footprint. And in line with that, greatly scaling back our aspirations uh, in terms of what we could achieve. Uh, and, uh, and essentially making sure and, and, and focusing instead on, is, is, is that pretty much what you're yeah. focused on? And, and rather than you know, trying to pacify the entire country, instead, looking at it sort of from the other side, trying to make sure that the, uh, the regime in Kabul wasn't overthrown by the Taliban, so making sure the Taliban couldn't succeed as opposed to defeating them outright, uh, and then in that context, uh, maintaining that platform so that we could do counterterrorism as much more narrowly defined using special forces and drones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I guess my view on that is I guess my, my position, and there are an infinite, an infinite number of positions that you can take along that continuum, mm -hmm. Uh, I think my position is certainly much closer to Vice President Biden's and would have been at the time than the decision that was ultimately, that was ultimately taken. I think I probably would have been a little bit more muscular than Biden, however, because I felt that in addition to doing counterterrorism as narrowly defined and supporting the, the buildup of the Afghan army, that we needed to be prepared, uh, again, using uh, special forces, not, not JSOC special mission forces, but, but Green Beret, um, uh, forces working with, uh, with uh, indigenous elements uh, to take the fight in those places where we could find uh, effective Afghan allies in areas that, that, f that fell within the, uh, the ambit, if you will, of the Taliban to help them uh, engage in, in insurgency against the Taliban. So counterinsurgency on behalf of the central government, insurgency uh, with, with uh, viable elements in the areas that would otherwise fall under Taliban control, and if it, if it were, if I had my way now, that's, that's what we'd be attempting to do now, which I think that we could do on a sustainable basis and with a, a, a relatively small number of forces, but clearly more than, in fact, we have now. I'm gonna ask for everybody's indulgence. We're over time. I'm gonna do one more question. We had a lot of hands go up. The young lady in the back, please. Last question, quick, please, and Bob, this will be uh, the last one. Oh, hi there, Anna Mulrine with the Christian Science Monitor. And uh, General H.R. McMaster, so one of the big uh, Pentagon counterinsurgency practitioners, was in town a couple of weeks ago. And he said 
he felt like one of the big mistakes that the US military made early on in Iraq, then again in Afghanistan, was to empower the wrong people. Uh, you know, we, we had a bunch of warlords that we uh, gave a lot of resources to. It, it went awry in, in a couple of different ways. And so I just wanted to see, you know, if you had some thoughts on how do you avoid empowering the wrong people as we mm -hmm. look forward uh, into Iraq and whatever operations we're going to be doing there and then uh, Syria uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Especially dealing through proxies against ISIS and other challenges. Right. And, 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 and actually to, to make the link between some of the things that we've talked about in the, in the Afghan context and the, the challenges that we're facing right now in Syria and, uh, and Iraq with regard to ISIS, once again, I, I would be very much in favor. I, I think the administration is, is smart to try to maintain a very small footprint. Frankly, I think I would be a little bit more aggressive than they are. I would be more willing to put special operations forces in harm's way than this administration apparently is. But I think that's the way that we should go. It should be US supporting indigenous elements on the ground. And where those elements are difficult to develop or unavailing, practicing strategic patience and not getting out ahead of ourselves and taking over fights that only lo local people can, uh, can sustain over the long term. But with regard to uh, your question, um, and yeah, well, how do you how do you choose the if you, if you want to deal with warlords uh, or the the equivalent of warlords in Syria and Iraq and Yemen and, and a bunch of other places, you know, how do you choose the right ones, um, and uh, and how do you make them the best warlords that that they can be? Well, that, that's hard. It, it's easy. I can I can speak very glibly and at great length uh, about you know how you should go about doing this, but but. At the pointy end of the spear, it's really, really hard. And it takes people with a real feel for the culture, with a knowledge uh, of, uh, of the, the languages, uh, a real deep understanding of the history in those local areas, um, and, and with great force of personality. And that is very difficult to do on a wholesale basis. And that's essentially what we are trying to get you know, our intelligence and, and, um, and military forces to do. And it's difficult under the best of circumstances. Um, but I, I guess one of the, the main points that I would make is that we, we should not be afraid to fail. And I think that that's one of the things, frankly, that has bedeviled the current administration, particularly in Syria. I, I feel, maybe wrongly, that if we had been far more aggressive early on in dealing with the so-called uh, moderate opposition in Syria, that they might have been able to gain traction much earlier and, and we would not have seen the space created that has now been filled by ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra and some of these other uh, extremist groups. I think the reason that we didn't do that was because we were very much afraid of, and, and many of these, of these, uh, of these uh, uh, members of the, the, the so-called moderate opposition, frankly, are local thugs. And I, I mean that in the most positive way possible. Um, um, no offense but, taken but, by but, the right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I grew up in Massachusetts, but there were lots of local thugs. But um, some of them were my friends. Um, but we, we've been very much afraid, A, of backing the wrong people. Uh, we've been afraid to provide them with military support, lest that support end up in the, in the hands of terrorists. Well, if your main objective is not to make a mistake, you're not going to get very much done at the end of the day. And I would be willing to take a risk of weapons falling in the wrong hands, and knowing inevitably that some of those weapons are going to end up in the wrong hands. Uh, but if we, do, if we want to affect the course of events from the margins, as we have to in fights that essentially are not our fights, but where we have a, a strong interest in the outcome, uh, that we've got to be willing to take those kinds, those kinds of risks. And knowing that uh, some of our, of our uh, warlord friends are going to disappoint us badly along the way. And that we may not be in control. And, and that we certainly will not be in control. Right. The, the best that we can do is try to influence. Um, we're certainly not going to have control. If you want control, then you send in you know, the, the, the third infantry division. Um, well, Bob, let me, uh, let me take this moment to thank you again for being with us tonight. A real honor for me to be able to host you here. Uh, thank you for your years of service. I had the privilege of watching a bit of that uh, from the inside. Mm -hmm. And thank you for writing a great book, 88 mm -hmm. Days to Kandahar, a CIA diary. I encourage you all to read it, to buy it. It's available in the back. Uh, and join me in thanking Bob uh, for his presence and his service. Mm -hmm.